and you guys are frickin' ripping me to part, apart. And I did nothing. I loved Annie more than any of you. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin, and this is Just Thought Lounge. This is the true crime channel that delivers serious, well-balanced coverage of the cases that really make you think. Today's case is a lesser known one out of Denver, Colorado. The story of what happened to Annie Meyer is as senseless as it is heartbreaking. This case offers an unsettling glimpse as to how someone with a close-knit, exceptionally large and loving family, an active social life, great friends, and caring co-workers can somehow disappear, missing for weeks before anyone began to suspect that something had gone wrong. By the time they knew to take action, it seemed too late. But someone had to know what had happened to Annie. And it quickly became clear that one of Annie's friends was far less interested in the efforts to find her than everyone else. Let's take a look. Leanne Meyer was known as Annie to her friends and family. In 2013, she was 52 years old. She was one of nine children, a large and very close family. Born and raised in Minnesota, Annie graduated St. Peter High School in 1979. Annie was very active and she loved sports. She was involved in volleyball, track, and softball. Later in her life, she took up what would become one of her life's greatest passions, golf. After graduating Mankato State University, Annie joined the Air Force. She served from 1984 to 1992, stationed at Lowry Air Force Base in Aurora, Colorado. After her honorable discharge, she chose to stay in the area, working first in healthcare administration and then at a U.S. bank based in Denver. Annie had a house in Wheat Ridge, a city just west of Denver. The city sits west of the Great Plains and also just east of the southern range of the Rocky Mountains. It remains an agricultural area and great for outdoor activities, which suited Annie Meyer very well. Annie stayed in frequent contact with her siblings and her parents, calling back to Minnesota to speak with her mother, Pat, regularly on the weekends. Annie also had an active social life and an extended group of close friends in the Denver area and back in her home state. On Thursday, the 7th of February, 2013, Annie was feeling ill and left work at the bank early. A few days later on the Saturday, Annie spoke with her mother over the phone. Then, for a period of roughly two weeks after, Annie continued to take sick leave from work, texting in on a regular basis to notify the bank that she was still unwell. A friend spoke to her briefly on the phone on the 23rd of that month, a Saturday. But as a stream of text messages from Annie continued to pour out from her cell phone to everyone she was regularly in contact with, those closest to her began to worry. Something was not quite right. Annie's work confirmed that they had not spoken with her directly since she left in person earlier in the month. The last text from Annie's phone was sent on the 27th of February. The very next day, the first report of concern for her well-being was made to the Wheat Ridge Police. Detective Mark Slavsky began looking into Annie's whereabouts. This case cemented in our thoughts. People don't talk to each other anymore. And so many people in the interviews. Well, I talked to Annie just the other day. No, they hadn't talked to Annie for months. They text. Upon further consideration, the friend that had stated they had spoken to Annie on the phone on the previous Saturday, the 23rd, could no longer say with any certainty that it had been, in fact, Annie on the other end of the line. The revelations about Annie's supposed communication over the month meant that her last known confirmed sighting was actually several weeks earlier than was originally thought, when she left work ill on the 7th. Sometime after the phone call with her mother on the 10th, Annie truly fell off the grid. By the time this was determined, nearly three weeks had passed. The Meyer family, most of them based in Minnesota, packed their bags and headed to Colorado. All eight of Annie's siblings descended on Wheat Ridge printing flyers, mapping out grid searches of the local terrain, walking Annie's favorite hiking paths, and connecting regularly with local media to spread the word of Annie's disappearance. A reward for information leading to her whereabouts was offered by her employer and topped up by family and friends, bringing the total to $10,000. It would later be doubled as the search continued. Missing with Annie was her cell phone, which appeared nonetheless to have been in frequent use. 
also her iPad and her computer. Annie owned two vehicles, a silver Toyota RAV4 and a blue Toyota pickup truck, both of which were unaccounted for in early March when Annie was officially declared a missing person. Photos of the vehicles were circulated on the local news and elsewhere with a tip line to reach police with any information. On the 13th of March, a tip led police to a parking lot only three miles from Annie's home where they found the pickup truck. The truck had apparently been sold to a man who had parked it there, but it was unclear if it was Annie or someone else that had sold it. The evening that the truck was located, a local woman and her son were watching a story about the pickup on the news. They noted that the second vehicle, the RAV4, was remarkably similar to one that had been parked outside of their house on the street for at least a week and a half. The woman, Paula Berg, said she had been conscious of the vehicle parked there since she needed to actively avoid it by making a sharp turn every time she backed out of her driveway. Following a heavy snowfall a week prior, the SUV had been essentially plowed in when the roads were cleared and no one had made an effort to dig it back out, which struck her as extremely odd. The RAV4 was confirmed to be Annie Myers. This left both vehicles accounted for, but still no Annie. While both law enforcement as well as grassroots efforts continued in their investigation and searches, there was one individual close to Annie that was conspicuously missing from the effort. Annie's former girlfriend turned roommate and friend, Melissa Miller. Melissa lived in the downstairs of Annie's home in the basement. She was out of work and Annie was helping her out. Melissa claimed to have last seen Annie as recently as the 25th of February, much later than anyone else in her life, including her work. Furthermore, as her roommate, Melissa was perhaps the closest person in Annie's daily life. Despite this, she refused to speak formally with police about the disappearance. The roommate is absolutely someone we would have liked to have talked to. Um, that's not an option. And we're gonna have to uh, find out what happened to Leon Myers uh, by a different route. Search warrants were obtained for the house and multiple visits were undertaken. A forensic team spent four hours inside. At the same time, dogs were brought in. If something bad happened to Leanne Meyer in this house, we don't, we don't wanna miss that. In mid-March, for the first time, police allowed Annie's best friend and her mother to go inside her home to look for anything missing. They saw nothing gone, said Pat Meyer. Annie didn't pack and go away. Her luggage was all there. I just think Annie was taken out of the house by force, her mother said. Melissa had spoken with an attorney who had advised her not to speak with police. Melissa's family told the media that she was willing to take a polygraph test to quell any suspicions and perhaps prompt investigators to move on to other avenues of inquiry. She was not willing to take the test with the police department, however. Melissa stated she would take a privately administered test and share the results with law enforcement. If she did take this test, she never shared the results. Journalists speculated later that she never took the test at all. Curiously, in the weeks that Annie was thought to have been missing, there was an unusual amount of activity happening on her debit card. Transactions totaling in the thousands, most in relatively small withdrawals, showed activity at ATMs, food shops, and casinos throughout the previous weeks. Security cameras capturing these withdrawals revealed a familiar face, that of Melissa Miller. Repeatedly, at machines all over the city, she was caught taking out funds from Annie's accounts. In addition, a drive through cash withdrawal machine recorded Melissa driving none other than Annie's Toyota RAV4. Do you think she did something to Annie? No. Because I know my daughter is a good girl, and she hadn't been brought up like that. Why isn't she talking to police? I don't know why. I really don't. Annie's friends believed that Melissa was after her roommate's money and they were convinced that Melissa was responsible for whatever had happened to Annie. On more than one occasion, they confronted Melissa, questioning her on her lack of interest in the case. On one such occasion, they approached Melissa on the street. Unaware that she's being recorded, Melissa insisted that she had been looking for Annie every day out on her own. And all of those tips to police, they all came from her, she said. Melissa claimed to keep an investigator's card in her pocket at all times in case she thought of something else that could be significant about the case. Despite what was being said in the press, she was in constant contact with law enforcement. Do you know that every lead the cops get that they say, a tip? It was me. It was me. 
It was it. I've talked to him nine or ten times. Melissa claimed that the tip that led police to the RAV4 had been from her. In fact, Annie had left Melissa use of the vehicle after she had been dropped off for dinner with a friend. She had it all along. It wasn't really missing. She mentioned her attempted suicide, brought on by the stress of her missing friend, four times in under 12 minutes. You guys are freaking ripping me to par apart. And I did nothing. I loved Annie more than any of you. I tried to kill myself. I don't want to live without Annie. I'm as lost as you guys. I tried to kill myself. I don't even know what to do anymore. I mean, Annie was my whole life. At the house, I dropped her off, Annie at Sixth and Wadsworth. Why didn't Annie just drive herself? Because she wasn't feeling well, and she got a bloody nose, and so they were going to go to dinner. So I just dropped her off. Melissa had no regular income, and she appeared to have been living off of Annie and not paying her rent. Police began looking into whether fraudulent checks were being written out of Annie's accounts and whether Melissa had been outright scamming her. They had good reason to believe that Melissa was involved in more than just a borrowed car and overuse of her friend's debit card. Melissa Miller, it would turn out, had a history of scamming former girlfriends and roommates out of thousands. Beginning in 2001, an unnamed roommate reported to the police that Melissa had stolen and extorted over $10,000 from her. At the time, she had done this by threatening to expose the woman's lifestyle. She got away with the money, and the woman did not pursue her for it. In fact, police sought her out for her statement. Just two years after her successful extortion, Melissa was in a new relationship and poised to do it all over again. In 2003, Melissa was in a relationship with a successful professional who had a bit of money. The two had made plans for their future together. Her partner had flown ahead to Costa Rica, and the plan was to begin scoping properties there where the two could buy a home together. Melissa was left behind with the banking details. She was meant to withdraw enough money for the house purchase. Then, using a blank check signed by her partner, she was meant to fill in what funds she needed for her own travel and then meet her partner there. Melissa did withdraw the money, and she did make use of that blank check, but she never got on a plane to Costa Rica. Melissa withdrew over $32,000 and then never left the country. Her girlfriend immediately demanded reimbursement and then filed a civil claim against her. Melissa again managed to get away with the money. In a tragic twist, less than a month after filing suit, the young professional was found dead in her bathtub. The death was ruled a suicide. She had left a heartfelt note to her family. This brought an end to the civil suit and Melissa kept all of the money. It had been five agonizing months. The spring sunshine and summer heat had melted the snow covering the picturesque trails across the mountains outside of Denver. With the cover now gone, property owners in Park County out for a walk on the 4th of July stumbled across what appeared to be human remains in the brush. They were later confirmed by the authorities to be that of Annie Meyer. It's bittersweet. I'm, I'm glad we'll have some closure. But in the same sense, I mean, there's all the unanswered questions. Uh, we're so happy she was found because detectives had told us we might never find, they might never find her. Had they been up to Park County before? Yes. Yes, they have. They, uh, she would go, they would go hiking, take the kids and go. There were items located close to where Annie was found that could offer clues as to what had happened. Plastic wrap was bundled in a small pile there was a hat and other potential items of interest. The autopsy was not able to determine the exact cause of death. These remains were, were found in a, um, in a very rural area and uh, there had been significant animal activity. With Annie now found, the case shifted from a missing person to a homicide investigation and the pressure was increased on Melissa Miller. Melissa Miller did kill your sister. What do you think the motive would be? Most things in life are about money. My sister was the nicest person there is. If somebody to take advantage of that, that makes me sick. There was enough evidence to bring her in for questioning. These interviews lasted over three days. On the third day, Melissa began to break down. 
she admitted that the two had been arguing over money. So we were just kind of walking and she poked at me and I just turned with the walking stick as a reaction and hit her. <laughs> Melissa wouldn't go so far as to admit that she had planned the attack. It was accidental, she said, an unfortunate reaction or overreaction. She hit Annie with her walking stick. Melissa then claimed that she attempted to stem the flow of blood but was unable to do so. The only material that she could locate nearby to serve this purpose, she said, was a box of saran wrap sitting in the back of the truck. She used this, she said, to wrap around Annie's head to stop the bleeding. When the plastic wrap failed, Melissa rolled her so-called friend's body away from the road and down a hill before driving away. She said that she quickly returned but could not find her, so again, she drove away, leaving her friend alone in the woods. Call for help. Okay. There was nobody, I mean, there was nobody around, and I should have gone for help, and I just panicked. But it was like, my life was over, and I did, I hope I did. Detective Mark Slavsky of the Wheat Ridge Police told the court at Melissa's bond hearing that she had no job. She had no home and had been couch surfing since Annie disappeared staying at her parents' house where she did not even have her own room. Melissa was considered at risk of fleeing, though she had no passport. Her bond was set at $50,000 cash. This was not attainable, so she stayed in custody. Then, in November 2013, the 55-year-old pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. In exchange for the plea, she was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Had the case gone to trial, Melissa could have faced a sentencing range of 16 to 48 years behind bars. Annie's mother, Pat, also believed that Melissa was well-versed in lying. What if even one juror were to believe her? I just felt that uh, she's lied about so many things that if we had a trial, maybe a juror would believe some of her lies. Under the conditions of her agreement, Melissa may be eligible for parole after only 13 years of her sentence. Melissa had pretended to be Annie over text messages for weeks, sending what has been called a flood of texts to her family, friends, and her work, pretending to be Annie who was still unwell. It's unclear if Melissa posed as Annie to sell the pickup truck to pocket the cash for the sale, but this seems like a logical assumption. She had managed to withdraw and spend thousands from Annie's account before her arrest and confession to police. When Melissa left Annie that day in the woods with a head injury and obviously immobile, she was left exposed to the elements and vulnerable to an animal attack. Detective Mark Slosky believes that one of these two outcomes were most likely, but that only Annie herself could possibly know. My personal thoughts are she died of exposure or of animal attack while helpless. And that haunts me. Annie's friends and family held not only a memorial service for her, but also later a celebration of life. They took turns sharing stories of Annie, a woman they said had a heart of gold and a positive impact on everyone who knew her. As part of the celebration, they released balloons into the air and, in a particularly appropriate gesture, they celebrated Annie by teeing off all in unison. In July 2022, Annie's brother Mark published a book about her life and disappearance. It's intended only for their family and friends in commemoration, nearly 10 years after her death, of a sister, daughter, aunt, godmother, and good friend that is still dearly missed. They said Annie did everything right in life, except for one thing, choosing her last roommate. That was the story of Annie Meyer. Thanks once again for joining me today. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge. I'll see you in the next one.